We're back for the second segment. Uh, Ryan, I, I want to kind of shift the, the focus a little bit now uh, more to kind of the state of national giving in the United States. When I started out as a, as a program officer at a Midwestern Foundation, we were all in awe of conservative donors and what they were able to do to influence the national agenda during the age of Ronald Reagan. Um, do you think this broad group of donors, both foundations and individuals, are still able to influence the national agenda? Hmm. I hope so. And I think, um, I think, I think so. The, the ways of influencing politics have also changed in that time. It's possible to give to political activity in ways that weren't possible 40 years ago, just through the new types of instruments and organizations that have been found. And so a lot of resources, you know, obviously are flowing in into that. And so it, that presents a challenge to, um, uh, those who would like to have a more patient eye to their giving, to look at change, you know, not in the next election or tomorrow, but things that we're trying to achieve in the next five to 10 years. I think that has maybe gotten, um, with all of the um, outlets we have available to us now, that's probably gotten a little bit more challenging to do. Um, people expect quick turnaround. That's why politics is satisfying to people because you have an election every two or four years. Um, and so, uh, and with more opportunities to give there, that's, that's often what's happening. Um, but having said that, I mean, I think there are um, a number of organizations doing really important work. I mean, I consider myself to be in one slice of those within the think tank community, um, but other uh, organizations with, with national policy fo focuses that didn't, didn't used to exist, wh whether that has to do with education reform or um, efforts to make it um, uh, easier for people to start businesses or, or change jobs at the local level. There, there are new organizations that have kind of sprung up in the last 20 years that a lot of conservative donors um, are giving to and can give to, to, to make changes, particularly at the state level, because that's where, that's where a lot of, of national change actually has to happen. It sounds maybe strange to say, but when you think about the, the reasons that we've, we've seen some of this decreasing dynamism, increased cost of living in our cities, the inability to start things because you need a particular credential, um, even the, 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 the right of, of workers early in their career to jump from one job to another, there are uh, lots of uh, laws have accrued at the state level which make that stuff really hard to do that just didn't exist 40 years ago. Well, some organizations have, have sprung up to try to address some of those issues. Um, and they may be national organizations, but they work sort of state by state to change some of these things. And so there, 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 there is the ability to, to make national change. But back you know, in the, the 80s, a lot of the, the problems domestically that we were trying to address were national issues, right? They were kind of the failures of the great society. And I mentioned some of those in the first segment, you know, whether it was our welfare or, um, or, or um, uh, how public housing policy and the like, but not all of them. I mean, school reform was always a state and local reform issue that created this ripple effect, right? As states started to copy each other, you started to have a national sort of outcome. And I think that's kind of what's needed with some of these other areas that I've been talking about, probably state by state, but working with organizations that know how to work with states and, and to create that kind of, kind of replication. So there, there, there are efforts out there um, for sure that could be, could be supported to create this kind of, of national change. And, and I would say too, for those who are concerned about things like um, the lopsided ideological stat, state of our American universities and the like, there, again, there are a few organizations that have sprung up in just the last 10 to 15 years to try to address that that didn't used to, to be there before. And you could, you know, and, and with more resources flowing into places like that, you can actually achieve quite, quite a bit. So we might just be on the front end of kind of a new wave of, of some national um, giving um, that we'll, we'll be able to look 10 years from now back and say, wow, there, we, we achieved a lot more than we thought was possible. Great. Let me get your thoughts on a, a, another significant trend in philanthropy. Um, over the past four years, liberal left of center foundations and individual donors have poured millions of dollars into voter registration, get out the vote, um, issue education work, data gathering, all of which is probably legal under the tax code, but certainly had a very partisan taint to it. Mm -hmm. On the right, you don't see the same thing, or at least not in such a significant way. 
So there could be three explanations for this difference. One is that conservative donors are really principled and want to adhere to the letter of the law. The second is that they really have a sense of vulnerability that they would be more likely to be called out for going over the line or skating close to the edge of the legal line than other donors. And the third explanation is they're stupid. They haven't figured out that the game has changed. What are your thoughts on that? Why, why do we see this real difference in the way that mm. the donor community has responded? Yeah, as I think about this more, my, my answer might change a little bit, but, but immediately I'm, I'm inclined to think that uh, there's some version of number one at play here. And, um, and, uh, and I don't say that to just put conservative donors on a moral pedestal, but to, to say that I, I think that the approach to social change is a bit different depending on what your public philosophy is. And um, uh, civic engagement on the left in America has always been very political. Um, and if you, if you have, if, if you go to a round table like I've done in, in DC multiple times, which is focused on how to increase civic engagement among uh, Americans, um, all of the progressives in the room are focused entirely on political engagement. That is their, that is their, that's your chief driver of social change. Right. Whereas the conservatives that will be in the room are focused more on movements um, and issue specific advocacy. And, and so I think, I think giving has tended to follow those, those trajectories. There's less of a confidence in politics to achieve lasting um, social change. And so mm -hmm. conservatives tend to give to other types of things. They, they give either directly to schools that receive students with vouchers or they give to organizations that promote that kind of change. Um, they um, are increasingly giving to some of these other types of new initiatives to promote work that I, that I mentioned. And so I think there's a tendency um, uh, because of, uh, I guess, a more um, profound attachment to the notion that civil society is broader than politics. It involves private actors and involves private organizations that just is reflected in the way that, that conservatives tend to give. You know, I will uh, just as a, as a point to add here, we do a lot of survey work at AEI. We do kind of large national surveys and we, we try to stay on the fringe of politics, but really focus more on what's going on at the ground level in America. And we found some really interesting things about people's um, social engagement and their, their civic engagement. And when we give, we ask some of those very traditional questions, like, are you, do you volunteer? Are you a member of some kind of voluntary association and see how people's answers play out. And then we measure them against other parts of the survey where we ask about loneliness, where we ask about how many friends they have, how often they and, you know, talk to their neighbors, these sorts of things. And we've, we found that um, uh, when you ask people about voluntar voluntary activity, I think we had about 11 different types of voluntary organizations, you know, your local congregation, a sports club, a veterans group, a local charity, what have you, kind of the traditional ones. And we found that as you would expect, people that regularly spend their time when they're not at work and they're not at home, kind of out in their community, helping out, um, they, they're, they're less socially isolated. They have lower loneliness scores. We're able to kind of assign loneliness scores to people. There's only one volunteer who's lonelier than the national average, and that's the political volunteer. <laughs> that people who only involve in poli who, whose, whose sole voluntary outlet is political in nature generally tend to be more socially isolated. Now, I don't know exactly what's going on there. I don't know if uh, politics just attracts lonely people or it just hollows out your soul once you're involved, maybe a bit of both. Um, but it, it does seem like there is something about um, the, the, the allure of politics, which is very strong, that people, people that want to make a difference, that feel like something's really wrong with their communities, and maybe something's really wrong with their lives, that they choose politics. And again, politics is a noble profession, and I'm not, not just dishing on it. But, um, but for people that see the world in a more textured way, realize that the solutions to problems can't just be from politics alone, they go in that direction. And so I think that's, I think that's how you see this, why we have this kind of left right divide in, 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 in giving. And, and I would say that, you know, I think it's basically been working okay. I mean, the, you know, there's a lot of money spent on the left. We're recording this right after an election. And um, for all that was done on the left in this last election, it doesn't look like it produced what everyone was expecting. Um, aside from, from, from Biden, uh, President-elect Biden's victory, you know, what, what happened in the electorate was proof that you kind of need to do more than, than just focus on get out the vote. Oh, that's a, a terrific answer, Ryan. Let me close with this question. So if you were a major donor, 
with an interest in public policy, where would you put your money? And saying that it should all go to AEI is <laughs> not an option. Uh, but seriously, where, where should donors be inve making investments? What issues, what level of government? You've mm -hmm. made a pretty strong case for the state and local, but how, how would you advise uh, you know, a wealthy billionaire who wants to give away a ton of money? Mm. Um, well, I, I think that having more donors um, who are engaged in multiple states at once um, would, would be useful at this point because we, there, there is a lot to fund at the national level. Um, but for organizations that are doing things in multiple states, I mean, I could name a few, but that where you're trying to change the licensing laws in five or six states to get a critical mass, sort of like learning some lessons from the school reform movement, right? Where mm -hmm. some people gave, gave money to organizations that were active in multiple states at once, trying to get charter schools to be legal, trying to, to normalize voucher programs. There's a lot that could be done um, on the issues of uh, housing affordability, making places more, more livable that way, um, making it easier for people to um, work without having to pay the government for the permission to do so, which is what licensing and credentialing does. There's, there's a lot I would say that you could give um, there to, to make a, a difference. Um, and another one that comes to mind, and this, this might be un, unpopular at first when I say it with, with a number of people, but I, I really don't think the solution for our universities is to just give up on them um, or to find um, alternatives entirely. I'm all for experimenting with things outside the, the norm, but I am a fan of, of the strategy that looks to try within universities to find professors with whom you can work to um, mentor students, to produce research, and to do that maybe through a center. I, I ran one of these at the University of Texas where you know, you're not um, you, you're a part of a department, but you have an independent center that's funded that can actually do work that kind of cuts against the grain. Um, and I, I think we really do need to have a strong foothold within academic life to, so that research maintains its credibility and all of that. And so the students get exposed to um, sort of a different take on kind of their issue area, whatever, whatever it is. And so I think uh, focusing on, on, um, on universities in that way is something that, that we, we really can't run away from right now, even though people are pretty exasperated with the state, state of the university in America. So how much importance would you put on supporting Washington-based think tanks. Again, you know, excluding your own. Um, it, you've made a pretty strong case throughout this whole two segments about the value of state and local policy. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the role for the big national think tanks? Well, I was trying to follow Mike's instructions and not ask for you know everyone to give money to AI. But since you brought it up, um, no, I, I do want to say that you know, so there are a number of think tanks that actually do some of the work that I'm talking about. In, in some of our issue areas at AI, we do that. So in our domestic policy work, I oversee our domestic policy, whether it's our education shop, uh, some of what our housing center um, works on, and, and I could go on, our poverty studies program. Um, we often will be working with state policymakers because we're, we're doing research on kind of a big national problem. You know, what's the right, what's the right level of food stamps in America to, to discourage or encourage work? But, you know, we can change policy by which the USDA issues food stamps. But at the end of the day, we need um, state and local governments to know how to implement those sorts of changes. And in the case of education policy, it really all happens at the state and local level. So they're actually, you know, we have these large think tanks. I'm in one in Washington, DC with a, a strong national focus, but a number of us actually do work with and advise um, leaders at the state and sometimes the urban or the, the city level. And so I think there's, if you care about those sorts of issues, there's a lot that, that think tanks are doing in that regard. And, you know, from where I said, having an insider's view, I am able to watch the way in which our scholars research gets consumed by staff members on the Hill, by members of the media. And I can see when the conversation's shifting a bit. I mean, I can give you some very concrete examples of the, the COVID um, relief bill that was passed and some bad ideas that went off the table and some good ideas that got included because of the work that our scholars were doing. I mean, I think things could have been worse. There were some really bad ideas that got expunged that I don't think would have been expunged if it hadn't been for the persuasive kind of just real analysis that our our scholars do. So, um, so I think at, at both the federal and state level, there's, there's still quite a bit of impact that the, the think tank community, which serves as kind of a bridge between kind of pure academic research and policymakers can, can still be making. Do you think it makes a difference that AEI is led by someone who's worked at the state and local government level? 
Um, yeah, no, I think w with Robert Doerr as our president, he, he, you know, he brings a real awareness of how um, policy gets made at kind of all levels of, of government. And he was, um, for those who don't know, he's the, the welfare commissioner in New York under Bloomberg when he was mayor. And before that had run the state welfare agency under Pataki when he was governor. So Robert um, understands um, that uh, level um, of kind of policy making and, and he knows the Washington making policy community really well. And, and so, yeah, it, it does. I mean, when it comes to um, consuming research, I mean, Robert will, will immediately think about how this, this would be implemented, you know, if you're actually trying to oversee its implementation at, at the local level. So that, you know, and, and he also brings his network um, with him, you know, to AEI, people that have worked in, in that space. So I like that because it, it overlaps with, with mine. Ryan Streeter, thank you so much. This has been a great conversation. Real pleasure to be with you. Thanks for having me on.